welcome to Ship Sea and the Stars from Royal Museums Greenwich. We are here to bring you incredible stories of the sea, space, history and creativity, all with Royal Museums Greenwich curators and special external guests. And if there's a question that you're really interested in, you'd like to follow up on or a subject that you'd like to talk to us about, please do get in touch. You can find us at Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. So today we are talking about ocean conservation and marine protected areas, both the formal modern versions, which we are hearing about more and more in the news, and they're often called MPAs, but also the historical attempts to preserve the ocean environment. Is ocean is ocean conservation such a modern idea? Perhaps not. Perhaps we're not very good at it and there are lessons we can learn from history about how to do it better. So let us meet our fabulous panellists for today. Uh, we have Ruth Thurston, who is a lecturer in biosciences at the University of Exeter. Laura Boone, who's the Lloyd's Register Foundation Public Curator of Contemporary Maritime at Royal Museums Greenwich. And we have Jean-Luc Solant, who's the, a principal specialist on marine protected areas at the Marine Conservation Society. So let's just hear a little bit from each of you about your connection to this topic. Laura, let's start with you. Um, so my job is all about exploring people's relationship with the sea. And I think like most people, my relationship began when I was very small and I was taken to the seaside um, with my parents. But I think now it's finding out all the kind of mysterious and wonderful stories about the sea. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, Ruth, would you like to go next? Yes, so um, through my job, I'm really interested in what marine ecosystems used to look like in the past, the ways in which we've altered them and what that means for our interactions and reliance upon the seas today. Brilliant, thank you. And last but not least, Jean-Luc. Um, my job is to take some of the work that Ruth does and others like her to try and demonstrate what the sea's potential could be, where we return them to their full richness and to try and develop policies that sort of restore that richness through controlling man's activities where it damages that potential for recovery. Brilliant. Okay, well, we are going to start today with a video. One of the problems with things that happen out at sea is that it's often a case of out of sight, out of mind. Um, although I would love to see the ocean more, I, I don't see it on a daily basis where I live and, and neither do most people, but that doesn't mean we don't have a relationship with it. Um, so, we're continually stuck, those of us who care about the ocean, when we're trying to convince people that it's worth thinking about because um, people only ever really care about things they can visualise. So the National Maritime Museum is currently hosting a fabulous photography exhibition called Exposure at Sea that was curated by Laura. And we're going to start by watching a video of one of the photographers featured on why uh, he chose, why, why he's, he particularly cares about one of the images in the exhibition. My favorite image in the exhibition is the diver with the big school of fish. I took this image in a very tiny area called Cabo Pumo in Mexico. Now it's a national park and it is considered a no-take marine reserve. That means that in the last 25 years, there, this area hasn't had any fishing activities. The marine life has recovered amazingly. And these fish, the big eye travalis, are gathering in thousands of fish with the purpose of mating and reproduction. Healthy oceans should look like this. That is the reason why this image is very special for me. Brilliant. Laura, well, you, you chose that video and, and, you, and the image that goes with it. So just tell us a little bit more about this photo and, and how it came to be in the exhibition. Um, so I think one of the things that I really like about this, this photo, and as Octavio says, is it shows you what, this, what the ocean should be like. Um, and it's also a photo of hope. And I think to understand it properly, you have to understand what was happening in that area before it became a protected area. So in 1995, um, Cabo Pulmo became a protected national marine park. Um, but up till then, actually, the numbers of fish were massively declining. There was people still fishing in the area, but they were finding it less and less commercially viable, even to support their own families. Um, so the community took the decision to protect the area. Um, legally, it's a 35% no-take zone, but actually the local people have made it a completely no-take zone. So, so no fishing happens in that area. And they found that in the first 10 years of protection, so from 1999 to 2009, fish biomass in that area increased by 463%, which is amazing. And the top predators, which we normally take as an indicator 
of kind of health of an area increased by um, 11 times. So I think quite often when we talk about the ocean and the conservation, there's lots of negative stories and we, we can't ignore that, but it's really amazing to have this picture to show that actually um, we can have a positive impact on our environment. And it, in this case, it was really driven by the local communities, which is great. It's it's a wonderful image because I think it's it really highlights, you know, the ocean is such a sparse place. Quite often there is life, but it's small. It's it's, you know, the individual animals can be quite a long way away from each other. And I love this picture just because it's all there's so many fish. And when you find this in the ocean, it's such a dramatic thing. You know, you really feel you're in the world of another animal. And um, just tell us a little bit about Octavio and his how he came to to contribute to this. And who is who is he in his life? Um, so Dr. Octavio um, is a marine biologist. Um, he spent his entire kind of academic career based between Mexico and the US. He's a Mexican national. Um, and a lot of his research is focused on the Gulf of California in Mexico. Um, and he's really interested in the use of marine protected areas, but also kind of how communities um, can be kind of involved and contributed to protecting that ocean. Um, he sees his photography as a really important way of kind of visualizing the unknown. Um, and, and often because we can't see the ocean, it's difficult for people to become engaged and want to protect it. And, and he sees his photographs as being a really important um, part of this work, his kind of advocacy role, um, especially with decision makers in Mexico, because obviously the people who make the decisions have to have that buy-in as well in wanting to see the value and, and wanting to protect these areas. Well, let's just talk a little bit about the the exhibition because you know it was called it is called Exposure at <laughs> Sea. Uh, I think people will be able to see it when the museum opens again. But it was there was such a the thing the brilliant thing about the exhibition is that so many of the photos are so surprising. You know, people live lives on land and they can genuinely have almost no idea of what's going on at sea. So just tell us a little bit about the exhibition and, and what it was doing. Yeah, um, so the exhibition showcased its six photographers, of which Octavio is one. Um, we really wanted to get across the huge range of experiences of people that are living with and working within the maritime sector, both on the sea and, and under the sea, um, and, and just really having that range. So, for example, we have someone who's an oil rig worker, someone else who's, um, we're going to look at one of their objects a little bit later, he's a commercial fisher in Alaska, and also those working in kind of conservation and research. And I think um, so much of people's work with the ocean happens away from, from sight by its very nature. It's often in remote, remote places. And so I think it's, it's really valuable to give people an insight into actually kind of what these working worlds are like. And what has the reaction been like so far? Um, good. There is a, a slight caveat in that we, we opened very early December. <laughs> so we had um, two weeks of opening and then unfortunately- That's an unfair question, sorry. <laughs> So due to lockdown, so currently it's quite an exclusive club to have seen um, the exhibition. However, we will reopen hopefully in, in mid-May and, and then the exhibition will be open for a year. Um, it's completely free and I recommend that people, if they can, um, come, come and visit it. And they'll definitely, I think, be surprised by the, the range of images. And just how, how important do you think it is that there's sympathy on land? Because you know, we talk about the ocean people like me talk about the ocean a lot but there's this kind of abstract thing and it, it's really difficult to rem to connect it in a way to people do you do you see that changing is there more interest what do you see on the ground when it comes to that kind of thing um I think definitely there's been a lot of interest and some of that has been driven through tv programs things in the media where people are seeing these really striking images or videos I think a lot of interest can be very focused on individual issues so people can get very kind of focused on things like single use plastics and microplastics, which are really important. But I think actually, when we think about the ocean and humans impact on it, we do need to think of it as a, a larger system. And I think that's maybe the area that, that currently we all need to kind of commit to spending a little bit more kind of time in trying to increase our understanding of it. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, well, let's move on to, uh, you know, the ocean seems like a, it's a hard thing to control is probably the wrong word, but a hard thing to influence. Yet we humans are clearly influencing it. But there are things we can do to treat the ocean better. So I want to come on to Jean-Luc and uh, your your object for us is uh, the sort of thing I'm very much a fan of. Show us your first object and tell us why you. Oh, OK, it. yeah. So I have uh, a copepod. <laughs> so that's not a real organism, everybody. It's a furry, fluffy toy that I stroke, um, and it makes me feel calm. Um, no, these, these are, that's a representation of something called plankton. 
and our oceans are full of this stuff and it doesn't really have any motile powers. It means it can't really propel itself against ocean currents. That's what plankton means. So, but, but the ocean is full of it. And this is kind of animal plankton, otherwise known as zooplankton. Um, but there is another type of plankton, plankton called phytoplankton. And it's so important to the biosphere, to our living system that we, we exist with, that every second breath you take is from the oxygen produced by plants in the ocean, would you believe? So um, we, we are concerned about the oceans, uh, sorry, understandably concerned about rainforests and deforestation, but the oceans are equally important. So let's just, I think the copepod is really interesting because, you know, as you said, there is an enormous amount of life in the ocean. There is an enormous amount of photosynthesis. You know, they're they're not plants, they're algae, but they're growing. They're contributing to the planet. There's all these little copepods and krill and lots of tiny animals, yet we can't see them. How difficult is it for you, you know, in your role as someone who's trying to convince people the ocean is important? How do you deal with this fact that it's not a tiger? It's not an elephant. It's not a thing that's got big fluffy eyes, you know, on land. How, how, how much trouble does that cause? It does cause trouble, but we could get hung up about it or we, we could just get on with it. Because I think the people who are interested about it are, are those with imaginations who maybe go outside their houses and see nature and then extrapolate from what they see to what they understand from people like me, this sort of event. And if you're interested, you'll do something about it. And not, it's not necessarily my individual job to be an educator although I do enjoy teaching when I do it, it's to try and convince politicians to do it on our behalf. So we can really, really agonise over this issue of like, it's out of sight, out of mind, as you quite rightly said, and that's my second object, which is a scuba regulator, because I love scuba diving and that made me see it, made me get the passion for it. But if we can convince the decision makers to act on our behalf, then we're, we're, we're going a long way towards it. And then once the results come in, as Laura talked about and those photos show, then we can show that, that we can we can actually manage this stuff and deal with it and make it more productive for us. OK, well, let's get to uh, marine protected areas, because it is this this phrase that we're starting to hear a lot on the news. And can you just sort of give us the, the lowdown on what one is, how many there are, and why they why they're important? Yeah, so we have uh, a marine protected area is any geographical space in the ocean or coastal fringe that is designed or designated for protection of one or more animals or plants. It's, it's as simple as that. It could be by legal means or codes of conduct, conduct or voluntary mechanisms. Um, and we have an enormous amount in the United Kingdom. We have 358 of them, 358 covering 38% of the United Kingdom's waters. Um, and they're there to restore biodiversity. Now, the way we're managing at the moment is none, nothing like that. And uh, the Marine Conservation Society and many other non-governmental organizations and friendly academics and um, lawyers and and civil society people really want to see them return this productivity, just like we saw in the image from Cabo Pulmo. And we just haven't got it here because we're not de dealing with trawling on the seabed, for example. Every MPA that is out there has trawling going on. Why is that? that that's not going to allow the seas to return their productivity. So we've done half a job. We've got a lot of these areas, but we've got to manage them. And just on the on the politics of MPA a little bit, I mean, it kind of seems... It's one of those things that sounds logically obvious that even if what you care about most is having a fishing industry, if you want a fishing industry, there is no point taking all the fish out of the sea because then there'll be no more fish. Why is this so politically difficult? These things get kicked around like footballs and they're sort of they're never it's always somebody else's problem. Right. What, yeah. What's going on there? It's a very complicated job because um, everyone feels very passionate about fishing. <laughs> Um, and fishing seems to be the biggest thing in, in this state, but I think the conservation sector has been a bit immature and actually just discussed it in terms of fish and biodiversity. But we're moving on to other things like we call ecosystem services. So the oceans are one of the biggest carbon sinks that we have. So if we keep trawling the seabed, we disturb carbon that gets released into the atmosphere eventually. If we disturb the seabed, we actually don't allow organisms that to filter the seawater and act as natural as Ruth is going to talk about with oysters. You know, these, these organisms just harvest the pollutants and toxic chemicals in the water for us. We, we've completely changed the system in the oceans and I think we're getting better at communicating that if we just leave the ocean alone, we don't have to spend too much money of, of remediation, active remediation, but if we just cause less damage, we're going to actually see a recovery within it. So I think the complexity has come partly because we fought battles about it rather than seeing the real potential for their for their regeneration. And and just find, just quickly, tell us about the 30 by 30 uh, initiative. Yeah, so that's a UN and wider goal that our government has signed up to, and many governments of the world, that we will th see 30% of our seas 
well managed and well fully protected by 2030. So um, we've got to we've got to start. And there have been some cautious starts by UK government. Um, since Brexit, we've had the opportunity to manage our offshore seas. And for example, the massive Dogger Bank protected area, which is over 12,300 square kilometers, the size of um, Northern Ireland, is actually likely to be closed from all forms of bottom toed fishing gear by, we would hope, the middle of this, um, this year. And if that's a portent to the future, where we have 76 offshore MPAs, um, there could be some quite exciting recovery. We might see some visions in our seas, much like in Cabo Pulmo. That, so I'm quite excited by that and I will try not to get distracted by it because the Dogger Bank is a fascinating place for arche uh, archaeological as well as ecosystem reasons. Anyway, let us move on. So these, big, these are big, difficult topics, how we protect our ocean and what we do about these things, but they are not new. Humans have been grappling with managing their resources, uh, protecting natural resources like this for centuries. So, And this is exactly the sort of thing that Ruth studies. So Ruth, could you tell us about your first object? Yes, so the first object is a uh, nautical chart, actually from the National Maritime Museum's collection. And this is the Firth of Forth, which is just to um, the north of Edinburgh in Scotland. So it's on the southeast coast of Scotland. And this was surveyed around about the 1850s. And um, for centuries, the Firth of Forth was renowned for its oyster fisheries. It, um, people would dredge for oysters, they would collect millions of oysters in a year. Now, by the 1850s, there was still very much an oyster fishery, but it was, um, it was well into its declining years. Um, so, and definitely by the 1860s, there were fishermen who were extremely worried about the state of the oyster fishery. And by the 1890s, it was largely commercially extinct. And this was a fishery that at its peak, it was estimated that 30 million oysters were taken out of the Firth of Forth, um, with still many more remaining to um, ensure the persistence of that fishery for a number of more decades. So is there information on the chart that's specific to oysters or is this just a general chart of how people found the water at that time? So it was mostly there for surveying purposes. So at, at the time, you know, they were they were trying to make um, our our waters safer. But what you can see is if you um, sort of towards the the bottom part of the chart to the east of Edinburgh, there are a couple of locations called Kakenzi and Preston Pans. Now about um, a short um, while offshore, there may be, you know, a couple of kilometres offshore, there are several um, points which say oyster grounds. Now, the Firth of Forth was renowned for having oysters over huge portions of it. These were not the only oyster grounds that they had, but these were the most famous. So um, they were near these um, so-called salt pans and the oysters were known as pandors. And they were um, supposed to be um, extremely tasty oysters. So they, they fetched a, a good price. So these were very well known about and they were still being fished at this period of time. Now, there's a, the, you have, as I said, this brilliant job description. Well, in general, which is topic description which is marine historical ecology. So you do, this is not a side issue. If you dig around in these old charts and old newspaper cuttings, um, why do you do that? What can you learn from that? Um, well, yes, that is very much my life, uh, my working life, at least. Um, so essentially, it, it came about from um, my my supervisor when I was doing my master's, Callum Roberts. He wrote a book called The Unnatural History of the Sea, which a number of people will have heard of. And and from that, he showed just how different our seas look today compared with how they used to and how we we do not appreciate this in general because much of our scientific monitoring data only goes back to a few decades. In fact, um, the first really thorough scientific surveys of the Firth of Forth came about in the 1890s and they didn't undertake any more really until the 1960s. So by the 1890s the oyster beds were almost all gone. There was there were fewer than a thousand oysters being landed down from tens of millions being landed a few decades earlier. Um, so without this historical perspective, these longer term perspectives that sometimes can come from scientific data, but not always, they have to come from written historical documents or, or people's individual or families' memories, collective memories of change. Without that, we tend to drastically underestimate 
what it is that you know what it is that we've lost and I got involved um, through my PhD looking at some of these old records and I have essentially been stuck there for the last 10 years I've not been able to extricate myself from it and there's still so much more to find out. And what's the because I guess the thing that's inter- the thing is we've spoken on other occasions and the thing I find most interesting is that there's this thing with newspaper articles, for example, where you kind of get personal reflections. It's not just here's all the data in a chart. Here is someone being really cross because someone did something they didn't like. And how, how much insight do you get from all of that about what the people thought about resources being used or used up or damaged? Well, I think that's that's a really important point about how people could be really cross, because much as uh, Jean-Luc was talking about in terms of, you know, there was lots of arguments going on about MPAs, you would have these arguments um, about whether fish stocks were declining, whether they were increasing, um, you know, the reasons for why that was. You would have these arguments and um, they came about in royal commissions where people tried to gather this evidence. Um, and it came about in um, yeah locations such, such as newspapers. So it's really important with all of these is that you gather as much information as you possibly can from all sides of the argument. And from that, you have to try and really distill what it is that people were observing versus what their opinions were and what they thought, which was sometimes, obviously, they were very valuable. They are valid opinions. But really what I'm trying to distill is is those observations of change. And it's when people describe the changes that they have witnessed directly, those are the most powerful. And they don't tend to be made up. They might be biased a little bit, but if you can get lots of these observations, you tend to be able to see which ones are the extremes and which ones you need to maybe you know, not take so much notice of. So it's, there's a bit of a, a learned skill in, and also a lot of work in, in sort of finding this information and, and weighing it up and cr- critiquing it, basically. And just very quickly before we move on, um, one of the things that we often feel about conservation, and I'm curious in your perspective, you know, your perspective on whether it's true, is that humans are a bit rubbish. You know, they go, oh, we should do something about this. We should try and do a thing. And then they completely fail. And then next time, the next time comes around, oh, we should do something about this. And then it sort of doesn't work and they completely fail. Does does all this digging about in, in history of the times we have been here before, does that fill you with optimism for the future? <laughs> um, oh, it depends what I read, really. Um, I, I have to say, I often think that obviously cultures change, people change to an extent, but really our our emotions, our reactions they don't seem to to change. Um, our understanding of the natural world has increased markedly since, you know, hopefully, as you would hope so, in the last 150 years or so. But really, there's been evidence for decades, if not centuries, of the impacts that we can have. And interestingly, I would just say it's, it's um, from a lot of these historical articles, it was often um, they would get um, people in power coming in before they collected um, statistics starting in the late 19th century. The only way that they could go and find out what was happening was to go and ask fishing communities and and fishermen. And it was always fishermen. They never asked the women or the children anything, unfortunately. But they went and asked the fishermen about their observations of change. And of course, that was very complex because you got a lot of differing opinions but often what you would find is the people who were the most worried were the people who relied upon those resources for their livelihoods so they were the ones shouting for decades about how um, they were concerned about um, you know fish declines in this case the oyster declines and often it was um, because the the people in power didn't always take note of those people and then of course that generation who'd seen those changes they died off And they passed away. And then the next generation who were not aware of those earlier changes so the cycle started again. And this is partly what my work tries to do is to stop that cycle from from happening so much by informing us of that large extent of change. So we don't lose it um, each generation. And that's a a phrase people may have heard is shifting baselines. And, you know, the fact that your measurement point starts from the earliest you remember. And that's always changes with every generation. Okay, so for we're all going to move on. So for those who are just joining us, this is Ships, Sea and the Stars from Royal Museums Greenwich. And this week we're talking about ocean conservation and marine protected areas with Ruth Thurston, Laura Boone and Jean-Luc Solot. So we're going to move on to Laura's second object now, which is a very symbolic of a very contemporary modern battle. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Laura, show us this object and, and tell us what it is. 
Um, so moving on from what Ruth was saying about often it's the people that are using the resource who are kind of the, the most likely to kind of um, protest to protect it. Um, I think the, the long struggle to uh, stop the development of Pebble Mine is, is a really good example of this. Um, so Pebble Mine is a proposed um, metal mine. Um, it's the world's largest unutilized um, reserve of copper ore. There's also significant amounts of um, gold. Um, but it also happens to be in a pristine area of Alaska um, in Bristol Bay, which is also the world's um, largest and most robust uh, rock eye or red salmon run. Um, so the flag that we have here and was actually flown on the boat of one of the um, photographers featured in the exposure exhibition, um, Corey Arnold, who's a commercial fisher in Alaska. Um, and you can, if you look closely, see the kind of <laughs> um, stains and, and slight grubbiness of this flag. You can tell that it was, was on his boat for three months um, in 2020 um, during the fishing season. Um, and, and this is, as you've said, a really quite long battle. They started exploring options for this mine back in 1987. Um, and the, the community has gone through many, many different stages of um, using different legal arguments, trying to get different levels of environmental protection um, in order to, to protect what they consider a really significant and sustainable resource. Um, it's a sustainable form of, of fishing, although they're taking out millions of fish each year. Um, it's done in a sustainable manner. Um, it brings in 1.5 billion to the to the local economy. It supports thousands of jobs. Um, there's 30 um, indigenous tribes that are also reliant on the fish for subsistence fishing. Um, and yet it was all at stake for this this one mine, um, which would probably last around 40 to 60 years. Um, so yeah, it's been through lots and lots of different um, stages. In 2019, the Trump administration removed the legal protection for the salmon and it was all looking um, fairly dire um, but luckily that decision has now been reversed. Um, a permit that's quite crucial to the mine was refused um, just at the change of administration and President Biden um, during his campaign said that he would um, ensure that the mine didn't happen. So they're still working to make sure that there's really long-term protection for this area. Um, but it is looking that actually people's huge kind of commitment to this cause, some people have been arguing against this for coming up to decades now, has, has had a really positive impact. It's, I was in um, Alaska the last time I could travel before all travel stopped. I was in Alaska at the uh, Alaska Forum for the Environment and this was everywhere. Like these signs, you know, protect Bristol Bay, stop Pebble Mine. And it really, it was also interesting, I think, because it, it lined itself up as this fight of the local population versus somebody else, you know, big corporations. And um, was it, what do you see in, you know, why are these things just in your, with your hats as, as a curator of contemporary issues? How do you pick the issue? Like, why is, why is this one of interest to the museum? Because it's history that's being made and you're keep, keeping an eye on it all. Yeah, I think it's always a, a, a challenge. And as a contemporary creator, I think the argument I sometimes get when I, I talk about these issues in the museum is, yes, it seems relevant right at this moment, but how do you know that it's, it's going to be relevant in, in the future? And obviously, there's sometimes a little bit of a gamble there. You have to say, well, and sometimes the argument is, well, it was very relevant at this one moment of time and it had these impacts in, in other areas. And, and that is enough of a justification for us, us to... To engage with it um but it is sometimes more of an art than a, a science i think but it does feel as though this particular battle i mean there's a lot of people that will be that see the message right that's why i think yeah. this is important is there's a message and it's bigger than this particular mine definitely and I, I think what's quite interesting about this is that it brought together so many different people so there's scientists there's local indigenous people there's commercial fishermen there's sports fishermen but then you've also had the industry itself. People raise um, concerns or they're seeing that there's so much negative press. You even had um, the jewellery industry. So quite a lot of uh, big jewellery companies, including Tiffany and Co, said that they would never buy any of the gold if it came out of this mine. So it's quite interesting that there's lots of different people that have come together in order to protect the, the same thing. And they do have different motivations behind that. But fundamentally, it's all about protecting the natural resource. 
And there's a point here as well that, that does relate to the, specifically to the ocean, which is that there are activities on land. So the, the idea here is that if this mine had gone ahead, you know, there's, there are consequences literally downstream, you know, that this washes out into the ocean. How, how do we see those things where, you know, it's actually something we do on land and the person who wants to build a mine on land may never have thought about a fish, even in Bristol Bay where there's salmon everywhere. And yet it has a really large impact on the ocean. How, how good are we at understanding the consequences of the things we do on land for the ocean? Um, yeah, I, th I think that remains a kind of a fundamental challenge about how we see the ocean. And often we see it as this very separate thing. Salmon can be quite a good example because of their life cycle. So they're a species that spends some of their time in, in fresh water. It's where they go back to spawn. It's where they spend their juvenile stage and then they, they spend their adult life at sea. So they're a really good example um, of a species where we can see that kind of interconnection. And actually they're really important in kind of nutrient movement. So they're bringing nutrients back into the, the river system. So I think salmon can be a really important focal species because we can directly see that kind of that movement. And I think in the UK, we, we often kind of miss that. So if we look at something like the European eel, which is this amazing species, but we often think of as just as kind of jellied eels <laughs> with a sort of slight morbid curiosity is this slightly niche thing that maybe not so many people want to eat anymore. But actually at one point they were so abundant in the Thames um, that they were able to put kind of nets in the actual Thames itself and, and they were very common cheap food of the poor, which is, is why we still associate them with East London today. And I think as lots of these kind of migratory fish species, their numbers have massively declined, that's kind of further eroded our understanding of how the, the river systems and the oceans are connected. But perhaps arguably that is now being replaced with how we look at, at ocean plastics as a significant amount of the plastics that's ending up in the ocean it is coming from our river system. So it's a horrible thing to be happening, but actually I think it's hopefully kind of raising people's awareness that what we do in London or, or what we're doing in kind of land-based areas is actually having an impact on the sea that it's arguably perhaps making in a slightly visible and, and kind of tangible way. Well, I just, um, I, salmon, the salmon, I think it's really interesting. No one ever talks about salmon at, out at sea. Like there, if you think, if you ask someone about salmon, they think about rivers, even though they're clearly going up and down the river and they're going somewhere. And the most, for, for anyone listening who we're not going to dig too far into salmon um, physiology now, but they do this amazing thing, which is they switch from being able to live in salt water to being able to live in fresh water. And it is the most astonishing physiological trick because they've basically got to switch these pumps in their body so they pump the other way they switch every cell in their body it's an amazing thing um so yes anyway look up your salmon ecology but not until we have got uh to our next couple of objects it's all very well to talk about people caring about the ocean uh people in general but in practice of course this switch happens one person at a time and Jean-Luc's next object uh speaks to when that person was him so do you want to show us what it is this allows you to breathe underwater, this very simple device. Um, it's called a regulator, or demand, which ends in something called a demand valve, which is this bit which you put in your mouth, so to speak. And it allows all of us, probably three, four of us who've all probably died, um, and the pleasure of, of that experience and allows, as we were talking about, a large part of our society to sort of understand the beauty of the ocean. And it was only invented about 70 years ago by Jacques Cousteau and um, Mr. Gagnon, I can't remember his first name, probably in the south of France, somewhere near uh, Marseille. Um, I'm half French, so I feel a bit of kindred spirit towards what he did. He was not an environmentalist at first. In fact, his first film involved killing sharks, killing whales, blowing up coral reefs. And then he became an anthropologist and a social scientist, a bit like Laura, perhaps, and an environmentalist, not just on, on the sea, but also on land. So I do urge you to look at his his back catalogue of films, because it describes almost humans interaction with film and in the environmental movement in its own um, history. Um, it's a fascinating story. But sort of following on from Laura, you know, I wanted to just say that I was involved in a campaign just like you were talking about. Is it Pebble Beach? Pebble Mine. Pebble Mine. Pebble, Mine. No, Pebble Beach is something else. I think it's a song. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was involved in a campaign just the same in the Manacles in Cornwall, where there was a threat to open a, a quarry there called Dean Quarry that was used for granite stone. And it was going to be used for stone to encircle a lagoon in Swansea where a license to come through. So 
and and it was partly thanks to that equipment I've just shown you that citizen scientists called sea search divers collected over hundreds of dives really important information to show the habitats that would have been damaged in the marine protected area adjacent to a land-based activity just what you were talking about earlier Helen so this connection between the land and sea and just like Laura described everyone got involved an ice cream maker got involved local lawyers who had second homes got involved and scuppered the plans of the um, Dean Super Quarry as it was going to be um, called so um, that that invention has been really important for my career and I think for hundreds of people to be inspired by the ocean and to sign campaigns or petitions or whatever else has made them lead towards thinking the oceans are important. It is so I, I do remember so when I, I I fell into oceanography by accident I, I moved to Scripps to study something else and of course it's, it's right where the ocean and I remember after three weeks working out suddenly working out what the ocean was that no one had ever told me and the immediate thing was I need to learn to scuba dive because yeah. how can you study something you can't see? And, you know, it's a load of faff. Basically, if you live in the UK, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever because, you you know, you, there's all this kit and it's difficult. You have to travel. But if you're living right by the ocean, you just go for a walk the way you go for a dive, the way you go for a hike. And it absolutely changes your view of the ocean. But I want to come back to what you were saying about Jacques Cousteau, because I, I think there's a really interesting story in terms of, like as you were saying, his, you know, the films, like he wrote the book called The Silent World when he, of all people, knew it wasn't silent. But anyway, I've, I've always wanted, I've never <laughs> asked his uh, grandson, he's around now, but one day maybe I'll get the chance to but this the visual right there were films this was early relatively early cinematography underwater cinematography right no one had really done that mm. he took cameras down there and suddenly you could see and that visual thing of that and it, they were these were just tell us a little bit about the because these were the great adventure stories when this came on tv yeah. in the 70s everyone was watching them no it was before that <clears throat> the silent world was filmed in the 50s Okay. We, we can't forget that. And he put cameras in boxes. No one had done this before. And he was using um, unique techniques of cinematographer, cinematography. He was using scientists aboard Calypso. Calypso was an old mining vessel and he converted it into an expedition cruising ship, went to the Red Sea and worked for oil, oil and gas companies. And he was doing sort of like surveys of the seabed for the oil and gas industry in order to fund his expeditions of his boy's own hero type things. So to watch the films and to see the reception of the films, would you believe it's the only natural history documentary that won an Oscar? I, I don't know if that's still the case, but it de definitely was the case up until 2000, 2005. No so he immediately touched a generation. He was involved with a royal family because they were major funders and benefactors, the Princess Royal and the Prince of Monaco, who still has... Uh, they I still think, are. They yeah, still exactly. are. Yeah. So, this heritage of what he achieved for the oceans and sadly hasn't resulted in any real protection that's needed for the Mediterranean. His, his great bugbear in his life, I think, was the death of the Mediterranean, you know, from when he was spearfishing as a kid or a young man, these huge grouper um, in, in the Mediterranean that are just not there anymore. That, that still is the failure of mankind to deal with it. And that's why we need marine protected areas. So, he is like the father of conservation, even though he doesn't know it and maybe wouldn't have even have had the magnanimity to, he would have never have sort of said he was because of what he did in his early days. But uh, a fascinating man, flawed genius, perhaps. Oh, I think they all are geniuses. They're all flawed, but that's all right. They're human. Um, so, okay, so, well, let's move on. So, you know, we're talking about connections to the ocean here and there's this one of the things the modern world has done is distance us from our natural environment. So let's let's go back to the past, to, to Ruth's domain again, and, and see what was being said about the importance of good stewardship. So Ruth, um, we've got a quote here from William Hannon. So let's listen to it and then you can tell us what it is. Just off Preston Pants, about a mile and a half, or two miles, there the trawlers come regularly down and put away their beam trawl. And I could take any fisherman or any member of this commission to the ground to about two miles off Kakenzi and then six miles east and west where they have taken away the upper crust of the ground. And mark you, it is the upper crust that the scallops of clams live amongst. We know by our dredges going over it, the crust is all gone. The crust is just a ground made up of broken shells and all the like of these sorts of things. And underneath that is mud. If we give our dredge half a fathom too much rope, she goes down altogether into the mud. So, Ruth, tell us um, who, who wrote this? What was the situation at the time? 
Yeah, so I'll just say, first of all, it's really nice to hear that spoken out loud. I've read it so many times <laughs> and to actually hear it um, said out loud. Um, yeah, so so uh, this this guy was a, a fisherman. He was a, a line fisherman living in Kakenzi. But at the, at the time, um, there was a, a, a big controversy over... Um, trawling over bottom trawling so when we think about uh you know Jean-Luc talked about how there's been controversy in in recent years through MPAs but and and trawls have been con controversial since they they first began I mean we first know about trawls um existing because there was a petition put to the king in uh, the 13th or the 14th century um and they described this terrible piece of gear that took up all of the small fish and um, around uh, the, uh, so yes, really from the, the 1860s, 70s and the 80s, the, the, the trawl fishery was expanding. It was going into areas where um, it hadn't been before. And fueling this controversy was um, the fact that often the trawlers were much bigger boats um, and they came from much further away than from other places. So, um, and they also, it was very difficult at the time um, because they were usually sail powered trawlers. Um, as were all the other boats, the lines and the pots. And so there was a lot of conflict on the fishing ground. It wasn't just that there was conflict in the markets um, with everyone trying, you know, trying to sell their fish. It was also that um, the trawlers would cut lines and things like that. Um, but not only that, uh, for the first time, um, lots and lots of, of fishermen were witnessing um, what was being taken up off the seabed through these trawls. And this um, ended up in a royal commission um, going around to a number of different places around the UK and um, essentially wanting to understand what the complaints were, uh, were, were that were being made about the, the trawl net and the beam trawl. You can see here the wonderful, very Victorian title, um, extremely long. But uh, and essentially they, they were interviewing, they were interviewing trawl fishermen, line fishermen, pot fishermen, um, oyster dredge fishermen and fishmongers as well, as well as business owners about their experiences of the trawl and the positives and negatives that came from this. And this was this quote that this man had had seen about, um, and, and the complaint was is that this, this sort of this, this wonderful kind of, um, essentially they called it a crust, but this is what the, the oysters would have um, been embedded into and, and what the, make, the crust would have been composed of would have been this, this shelly ground. It would have been these essentially these, these interwoven shells that would have grown, they would have locked together. They would have created this, um, not really sort of high relief, but you know maybe quite low relief, but nevertheless highly complex, and in some cases quite high relief um, habitat that um, was this, it would have holes for animals to hide in, it would have a huge surface area, lots of things to settle and grow on. And this is where you would find um, the oysters, the horse mussels, the blue mussels, the, the, the scallops, and amongst this. And this is what they were seeing was disappearing at the time. So I find this really interesting because, you know, when we think about trawlers today, so I have seen, you know, I've been on ships where we've put down cameras and you can see exactly where a trawl has been because it's basically just scraped off the bottom of the ocean. And these are slow growing species. They don't grow back. You can see you can literally see the lines from decades ago. But I'm interested because back then, you know, they didn't have underwater cameras. It wasn't, you know, all this very direct evidence wasn't available but they seem to have come to the right conclusion pretty quickly is that just because their knowledge of their environment was that much better than ours um i think there was there definitely was some of that um uh, but this was also partly the 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 undoing and why um it was ultimately these concerns were ignored was because there were these these very much these 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 first hand remarks and um and this is a particularly you know an articulate one about this crust um, but a lot of fishermen, they would see what was being brought up, but, but of course they didn't necessarily know what it was called. We didn't, we didn't have much, many, you know, we were only just starting to identify a lot of the marine species at that point. And that was usually, you know, only a handful of naturalists knew what all of these species on the seabed were back in the 1880s. And so what they would often do is they, they would describe really wonderfully what was being brought up but they they wouldn't necessarily know what to call it so often they would talk about these casts of animals they would say these oranges these 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 reds and these browns would come up which you know could be they could be soft corals they could be sponges they would also talk about 
um, sort of these jelly-like masses um, that would hang down from the trawls as they came up. And they would also talk about spawn. And this could be, they, they described it in many different ways, but they really believed that it was the, you know, the spawn of fish. That makes a lot of sense. Um, what scientists were beginning to learn by that point was that a few species of, of fish would have their spawn on the seabed like herring, um, but actually most spawn would end up being in a part of the, the plankton that um, Jean-Luc talked about earlier. So the people who were interviewing them said, well, clearly they don't know what they're talking about because they're describing spawn and we know it's not spawn. But again, this comes down to observations versus interpretation it's they absolutely were seeing what they were describing they just they just hadn't been given the scientific tools to describe that and then the people who were taking that information on board were just not in tune with with what else it could have meant but how i mean it is such a credit to the careful reporting that they wrote down these things even though they didn't believe them and couldn't explain them because with modern knowledge we can look back i mean that that's a that's an amazing thing even if they didn't sort out the fishery, they did collect genuine evidence that we can judge again, which is awesome. Yeah. And OK, so we are almost out of time, but I have what, well, as always, we could keep talking about this for a lot longer. But I've got one question for each of you uh, before we finish. And it's this that, you know, we've talked about the difficulties of relating what's in the ocean to a human life on land. If each of you could show everyone on earth one thing tell them one story or show them one photograph put one mental image in there that convinces them that the ocean is an important thing that we all ought to care about what would it be um laura I'm gonna pick you first um okay so i think for me it's just asking everyone to take two breaths um and everyone can do that now and it, at least one of those breaths is made up of oxygen that's been produced by the ocean the ocean is fundamental to our survival that is, it's a very powerful way of making that point. Thank you. Um, Ruth, you can go next. Yeah, I think I would just in, in common with my, my area of research, I'd be saying to people, go into uh, museums, go into, you know, where, uh, wherever you might want to go, art galleries, and go and have a look and find an old picture that shows people next to the ocean or that shows people fishing. And there's not always a whole heap of these, but um, the ones that are there, can show you just how long our relationship with the seas have been going on for and just how we've relied upon them and you know what they've they've given to us in the past and how we really need to maintain and, and improve that relationship well when everyone's when everyone's allowed out there's there's one of your priorities see your friends and then go and look for some uh, old paintings of fishing people which is it's a lovely idea um, and last but not least John Luke uh, there are images existing already of the thing I'd like people to think about a bit more, which is the massive carving of ice flows that are occurring in both our poles at the moment. And think about what and support governments that are trying to get to net zero by 2050, because it's the only chance we've got. <laughs> very concisely put and very true. Brilliant. Well, um, we will be back uh, with, uh, we at Royal Museums Greenwich, we'll be back with more museum objects and stories of the sea, space, history and creativity. Uh, if there's a question that you'd like answered or a topic that you'd like to, us to talk about, please get in touch. We're Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And um, if you would like, if you liked today's episode, there are plenty more. We have built up quite a collection over the past year and they're all online at rmg.co.uk slash museum from home. And there are all kinds of topics in there. Um, so many and they're, they're all different and brilliant. So do have a look at those. And do remember that the National Maritime Museum, the Cutty Sark, the Royal Observatory and the Queen's House will be open again. They will open their doors sometime in May, we hope. And there is loads going on in and around Greenwich already and if you'd like to know more um, about what's going on at the museum uh, and in and around Greenwich go to rmg.co.uk slash visit Greenwich and so it only remains for me to thank our three fabulous contributors Ruth Thurston, Laura Boone and Jean-Luc Solant. Thank you to Simon Kane for the reading, to Steve Thompson for the music, uh, James Gill was the producer and I'm Helen Cheresky. Thank you and goodbye.